Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Sound Recovery Services LLC is proposing to establish a new healthcare facility. Specifically, it seeks to establish a new day treatment and outpatient behavioral healthcare facility for adults with moderate to severe substance use disorders and co occurring mental disorders in Bridgeport, Connecticut. The anticipated capital expenditure is $45,000. Uh, today is September 5th. 2024. My name is Daniel Chuka, OHS Executive Director DJ Grifford. Ex excuse me, she is now Commissioner as of this past legislative session. OHS Commissioner DJ Grifford has authorized OHS General Counsel Anthony Casagrande to designate hearing officers for CON matters, and he has designated me to serve as the hearing officer for this matter. To rule on all motions and to recommend findings of fact and conclusions of law upon completion of the hearing. This hearing is being held online utilizing the Zoom video conference platform as authorized by Connecticut General Statute Section 1-225A. In accordance with this statute, any person who participates orally in an electronic meeting shall make a good faith effort to state his or her or their name and title at the outset of each occasion that such person participates orally during an uninterrupted dialogue or series of questions and answers. We ask, we ask that all members of the public mute the device that they are using to access the hearing and silence any additional devices that are around them. This public hearing is being held pursuant to Connecticut General Statutes Section 19A-639A sub F sub 2. Although this does not constitute a contested case under the Uniform Administrative Procedure Act, the manner in which OHS conducts these proceedings will be guided by the UAPA provisions and the regulations of Connecticut state agencies at sections 19A-9-24 at SEC. Although I will be asking the majority of the questions, Office of Health Strategy staff is also present to assist me in gathering facts related to this application and may also be asking the applicant witnesses questions. At this time, I'm going to ask each staff person with me to identify themselves with their name, spelling of their last name, and OHS title, starting with Stephen Lazarus. Good morning, Stephen Lazarus, L-A-Z-A-R-U-S, and I oversee the Certificate Review Program. Steve, we are having some difficulty with your mic again. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. I, I don't, I just want to make sure that the applicants can hear you. It's a little bit, uh, it's, it sounds Muffled. like you're underwater. Yeah, it's muffled. <laughs> yep. Uh, I'll work on that. Um, in, in all likelihood, he won't have that many questions. <laughs> so uh, when he does speak, he will, I'll make sure that he speaks up or clarifies or speaks louder. Sure. Um, so the next person on the list is Annie. Good morning, my name is Annie Faella, F as in Frank, A-I-E-L-L-A, -L -L and I am the CON team lead. And Ormond? Ormond, are you with us? Did he drop off? I saw him previously, but I don't okay. seem to see him now. Uh, I will introduce him, uh, Ormond Clark, last name spelled C-L-A-R-K-E, and uh, perhaps someone can fill me in on what his exact title is. I don't want to botch it. He's, he's one of the analysts. I'm just not sure. He's a an analyst, a healthcare analyst. Okay. And you have a time that I can see that in issue. Um, and then next would be Jess. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning, Jessica Rival. I am a healthcare analyst with the Office of Health Strategy, and my last name is spelled R I V as in Victor A L. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Armin Clark, and I'm a healthcare analyst, and my last name is spelled C L A R K E. Thank you, Armin. Uh, also present is our office's paralegal, Faye Fentis, 
who is assisting with the hearing logistics, gathering the names of, for public comment and providing miscellaneous other support. Um, speaking of public comment, sign up for public comment has started. If you would like to make a statement at today's hearing, please put your name in the Zoom chat and we will be happy to provide you with the opportunity to speak at a later time. Uh, sign up will continue until the public comment portion is scheduled to begin which will occur immediately following most of the technical portion of the hearing. Uh, I say most because there are uh, just a few items that will occur uh, after that, uh, but it's, it's essentially after the technical portion of the hearing today. Um, the certificate of need process is a regulatory process, and as such, the highest level of, res of respect will be accorded to the applicants, members of the public, and our staff. Our priority is the integrity and transparency of this process. Accordingly, decorum must be maintained by all present during these proceedings. This hearing is being transcribed and recorded, and the video will also be made available on the OHS website and its YouTube account. All documents related to this hearing that have been or will be submitted to OHS are available for review through our Certificate of Need portal, which is accessible on the OHS CON webpage. In making my proposed decision, I will consider and make written findings in accordance with Section 19A-639 of the Connecticut General Statutes. Lastly, as Zoom notified you in the course of entering this hearing, I wish to point out that by appearing on camera in this virtual hearing, you are consenting to being filmed. If you wish to revoke your consent, please do so at this time by exiting the Zoom meeting. I am going to start by going over the exhibits and the items of which I am taking administrative notice, and then I will ask if there are any objections. The CON portal contains the pre-hearing table of record in this case. At the time of its filing on Tuesday, exhibits were identified in the table from A to R. Uh, OHS staff, do you have any additional exhibits that you wish to enter into the record at this time? No, thank you. Thank you. Um, and the applicant is hereby noticed that I am taking administrative notice of the following, the statewide healthcare facilities and services plan, as well as its supplements, the facilities and services inventory, the OHS acute care hospital discharge database, all payer claims database claims data, and hospital reporting system that is HRS financial and utilization data. Um, I may also take administrative notice of other prior OHS decisions, agreed settlements and determinations that may be relevant to this matter, but which have not yet been identified. If applicable, I will provide the applicant with an opportunity to respond so, to anything so noticed. Uh, counsel for the applicant, can you please identify yourself for the record? Gladly. Uh, good morning, um, Hearing Officer Chuka. My name is Erica Nolan, Herwitz, Sager, and Salzberg, and Neff here on behalf of the Applicant Sound Recovery Services LLC. Thank you. Um, do you have, let's start with the exhibits. Do you have any objections to the exhibits that I identified in the table of record? Um, Generally, no. I will just note um, for the record that exhibit P that was submitted contains a minor inaccuracy in that the town of Durham is included, which is not in our uh, proposed service area. But we'll just note that for the record. We're not um, you know, going to make a big deal about it by any means. Just want to note that that was included. Okay. Um... So after the hearing, we can uh, prepare a corrected version of this. Sure. Uh, I'll probably, I'll give it a new exhibit letter um, just so that we have clarity of the record. Um, so that will be, well, I'm not sure what letter that'll be because we may have some, some late files and such, but it'll probably be S, S as in Samuel. That's perfectly fine. Um, let's see. Uh, with respect to the items that I took administrative notice of, do you have any objections to those? No objection. Thank you. Um, and do you 
have any additional exhibits that you would wish to enter at this time? Uh, we do not at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will proceed in the order established in the agenda for today's hearing. Um, I would like to advise the applicant that we, we may ask questions related to your application that you feel you have already addressed in the course of your application and completeness letters and uh, pre-filed testimony. We will do this for the purpose of ensuring that the public has knowledge about your proposal and for the purpose of clarification. I want to reassure you that we have reviewed the docket and we will do so again before issuing a decision. Anyone attending today should enable the use of video cameras when testifying or commenting remotely during the proceedings. All participants and the public should mute their devices and should disable their cameras when we go off record or take a break. Uh, please be advised that although we will stop the recording, um, the video and the audio will likely continue. Uh, so anything that you say or do uh, may be visible or heard by other participants at the hearing. Public comment taken during the hearing will likely go in the order established by OHS during the registration process. However, if there are any, any public officials who, uh, who wish to make comments, I may take them out of order. Um, and as I mentioned, registration for public comment has already begun. If you would prefer to submit written comment, you can do so to concomment at ct.gov. And I would also ask that the applicant's witnesses be available after the public comment, as OHS may have additional follow-up questions based on the public comment. They will be so available. <clears throat> Are there any other housekeeping matters or procedural issues that we need to address before we start? Not from the applicant. Thank you. So we're going to proceed to the technical portion uh, Attorney Nolan, would you like to make an opening statement? Uh, I will reserve my comments for the end um, if if it if that's all right with the hearing officer. That's perfectly acceptable. Great. Um, so we are going to start with Phil, I believe. Um, so can Phil, can you please identify yourself by name and title? Sure. It's Phil D. Gennaro, D-I-G-E-N-N-A-R-O. I am uh, a managing member of Sound Recovery Services. Um, I reside in Trumbull, Connecticut. Um, my pre-filed testimony has been filed. And um, but, but Before you get into your, your statement, I, I do have to uh, put you under oath. Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, so please raise your right hand, as you've already done. Do you solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm as the case may be, that the evidence you provided in your pre-file testimony and the evidence that you shall give or have already given in this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God or upon penalty of perjury. Yes, I do. Thank you. You're welcome. And I am sorry I interrupted you. You can no. uh, proceed whenever you're ready. Yeah, I'm not, not a problem. Um, well, let me just do a few foundational things just to um, establish your pre-filed testimony, Mr. DeGenero. Um, did you prepare or supervise in the preparation of your pre-filed testimony, which has been admitted as Exhibit K? Yes, I did. And do you have any additions, clarifications, or modifications to your pre-filed testimony that's admitted as Exhibit K? No, I think it uh, speaks for itself. And is it true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? Well, yes, it is. And do you adopt the information contained in Exhibit K as your testimony here today? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, Mr. DeGener, I, I think we were about to get into, um, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how it was this project? Yeah, sure. So um, born and raised in Bridgeport, Connecticut, educated in Connecticut. Um, I've worked for the last, I would say, 35 to 40 years, primarily in Connecticut, primarily in real estate development and startups of certain of different businesses. Um, so, you know, as is in my testimony, um, we've had experience in our family with substance abuse. Um, it's something we care deeply about. And um, my role in this um, venture is primarily financial as an investor, um, with folks that will be operating the center. I know very well, obviously one of them is my son and it's, people that he works with currently up in Massachusetts. And, um, you know, I think it's um, a need that we have in the state that, you know, really, really has to be addressed and filled. 
Um, at the same time, it's you know it's it's a business and it needs to make viable sense for it to be successful. Um, so I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Um, but for now, that's it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. De Janeiro. Sure. Um, would you like to have the rest of your witnesses come in one by one at this time or? Sure, I'm happy to do that. And that way um, we can just, um, whatever questions the office has, we can address those uh, depending on which witness it's most applicable to. Okay. Great, so I'm just going to um, mute and turn my camera off and we'll switch our witnesses out and I will be right back. Sounds good, thank you. Thank you. All right, there we go. I started talking without unmuting myself. Um, <laughs> so we are uh, back and we have James DeGenero with us as well um, as our next witness. Thank you. So uh, Mr. DeGenero, can you please uh, give us your name, spelling of your last name and your title or your relationship to the, uh, to the project? Sure, uh, James DeGenero, D-I-G-E-N-N-A-R-O. I am a member as well, and yeah. Okay. Uh, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm, as the case may be, that the evidence you provided in your pre-file testimony and the evidence that you shall give or have already given in this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God or upon penalty of perjury? Yes, I do. I have uh, uh, landscaping people right outside my door, so I apologize if you can hear that. <laughs> that's okay. If it, so uh, if it helps, expected. we normally have construction right outside my building that has gotten picked up on so many Zoom calls, so I understand entirely. Okay. Um, I can still I hear you. I, I just want to make sure that you can still hear me. Okay. You're, we can hear you. Um, so, uh, Mr. De Janeiro, you can... Or uh, Attorney Nolan, did you have any preparatory remarks for him as well? Sure, sure. I'll just ask him to adopt his uh, his testimony. Did you prepare or supervise in the preparation of your pre-filed testimony, which has been admitted as Exhibit L, which I have a copy in front of the witness? Yes, ma'am. And do you have any additions, clarifications, or modifications to your pre-filed testimony that has been admitted as Exhibit L? I do not. And is it true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? Yes, ma'am. And do you adopt the information contained in Exhibit L as your testimony here today? Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay, Mr. DeGenero, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how it relates to this project? Sure. So, uh, like my father, uh, I grew up in Trumbull, Connecticut, in the Bridgeport area. Um, I'm someone who's personally been affected by this disease. A number of times I've tried to battle this thing throughout the past, um, just shy of a decade from when I was probably about 20 years old, um, looking for treatment myself, uh, multiple friends, close people to me who have also suffered from this addiction. Um, I'm coming here today just to kind of give my, my personal experience, say I've, I've lived through this thing. Um, it is very real in, in the area that I come from, uh, in the surrounding area. I just remember times where it was time to look for help and, and kind of seek guidance personally for battling this thing and um, both in my area and from, from like a stigma standpoint, this was not talked about. And from a resource standpoint, 
I, uh, the best guess I had was to go on Google and, and look around for, you know, addiction treatment centers near me. Eventually, I had been relocated to Massachusetts, which I currently reside in now. Um, and there were some folks up there that really showed me the way that there was a, with a, with a people-oriented approach, treating me like a human being. Uh, I was shown the way as to how, to how to get a grip on my addiction and to be shown there was hope at the end of this thing. I wasn't the only guy who came from uh, Trumbull, Connecticut, or, or other states, or, or in my area, who could be helped in this sense. Uh, I like to say these folks also tricked me into falling in love with the work, which I, I currently am. Uh, I work up there in Massachusetts, currently at a treatment center, just with clients, um, some administrative stuff, and there's something about peer-to-peer -peer interaction, uh, being in the same shoes as the folks that you're serving, that really matters. And Mr. DeGenero, how do you, how will your experience be beneficial to those in the Bridgeport and greater Fairfield and New Haven County community? Yeah, so having grown up in the area, I know how real it is. Um, I know that this thing does not discriminate, whether it comes to race, demographic, uh, social, economic status. Um, and that's just from being in my personal experience. And um, that is all we have from Mr. De Janeiro at this time, if the hearing officer has any questions. Um, or we can switch out for Mr. Roberts. Yeah, I, 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 I do have questions. I'm just not sure who, the, who they will be directed to. Um, so I think let's move on to Mr. Rockholtz and then um, we can move on to my questions afterwards. Gladly. Uh, so we will just, I will switch those witnesses out and we will be right back. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have uh, Mr. Rockholtz here with me as well. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rockholtz, can you please uh, spell your last name and identify your, your title and your relationship to this project? Yes, it's Peter Rockholtz. It's R-O-C-K-H-O-L-Z, it's in Zebra. Uh, I am serving currently as the compliance officer as a consultant uh, to uh, Sound Recovery Services, I am not an owner. Um, and uh, following uh, this process, uh, the board will uh, appoint me as executive director to make sure that this project goes ahead with quality and compliance. Thank you. Um, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear? or solemnly and sincerely affirm, as the case may be, that the evidence that you provided in your pre-filed testimony and the evidence that you shall give or have already given in this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God or upon penalty of perjury. I do. Thank you. Uh, and Ms. Nolan, did you have any comments for him? Sure, I will just uh, similarly just ask him to adopt his pre-file testimony. Um, Mr. Rockwells, did you prepare or supervise in the preparation of your pre-file testimony, which has been admitted as Exhibit M? Yes, I did. And do you have any additions, clarifications, or modifications to your pre-file testimony admitted as Exhibit M? No, I do not. Is it true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? Yes, it is. And do you adopt the information contained therein as your testimony here today? I do. I have no further questions for Mr. Rockholtz. I will uh, allow him to take the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, Hearing Officer Zuka, good to see you. Um, and members of the OHS staff, some of whom I've uh, worked with over the last several years. Good morning, um, I appreciate the opportunity to testify here. 
my, my intent is to um, do a couple of things. One is to uh, provide support for this project. I think it's a very important one. And to respond uh, in summary to the issues that were raised uh, and, and uh, to uh, introduce myself. Um, I'm going to uh, start out by saying today is September 5th, which is a very important day for me. It was 51 years ago today that I started working in addictions here in Fairfield County in my hometown of Norwalk. I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to work in uh, a long-term residential program that my little brother was in from age 14 to 16, and then was given the opportunity to uh, start as a trainee, uh, having to live in for six months and learn uh, about myself and about uh, what I can contribute to others. That program in Norwalk B. Tom Center uh, saved my little brother's life and it saved my life and put me on a career path that I uh, decided to follow for the next 50 or so years. Um, in terms of the work that I've done, I, I sort of want to kind of establish myself uh, here to, as a national expert, uh, which is my role. Um, I say national expert because it seems like you can't be an expert in your own state, so I'm not really acknowledged in Connecticut. And maybe, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you my background and you can judge for yourself. Um, so I uh, worked for about 25 years uh, in a number of nonprofit uh, residential, long-term residential programs in Connecticut that no longer exist. They've been kind of regulated out of existence uh, here in Connecticut and uh, we're part of the backbone of Connecticut's uh, wonderful nonprofit uh, uh, addiction treatment uh, network. Um, um, that Connecticut is 85% uh, services for SUD in the nonprofit sector, the highest in the country. And uh, so I was a part of that for about 25 years. So then um, moved to work in prisons, um, providing uh, support and guidance to set up drug treatment in prisons on behalf of the Department of Justice nationally, uh, and also worked as a consultant for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, um, providing support for states and guiding states in their responses to the opioid uh, epidemic. Um, and to um, improve treatment for opioids. Um, I worked in as a consultant in 30 states. Um, I then was asked uh, to uh, serve uh, as in the office of the Deputy Commissioner for Addictions for the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, DMS, uh, under Governor Rell or five years where I was responsible for all of the community services uh, in the entire addictions uh, arena in Connecticut and also community mental health services. Uh, so I kind of, I'd already known everybody. It's a small, Connecticut's a small town. We all know each other and have had for many years. Um, so, uh, but I, had, I was responsible for the, the state system. Um, and, and then took the model that we developed in Connecticut for the recovery-oriented systems of care um, to, to other states to help um, them become more recovery-oriented. Uh, in terms of training, I uh, have a master's degree in social work. Um, I was uh, formerly uh, faculty at Yale School of Medicine and currently uh, faculty at Columbia School of Social Work, uh, my alma mater, where I supervise graduate students. Um, so that's that's my uh, background in a nutshell. Um, I, I wanna talk a little bit about the model that this uh, applicant is proposing here. It's, it's a model that's been emerging over the last 10 or so years. Um, which is essentially a partial hospital program, PHP, which is the day treatment program um, with uh, affiliated available uh, supervised supportive sober housing, uh, not required, but uh, available. 
Um, this is a model that I proposed to Governor around 2007 as a solution in the mental health arena, but also in the substance use disorder arena as an alternative to residential treatment because residential treatment was deemed to be um, too costly and not enough people were able to be served in that. So this is an er early model that was uh, I proposed a long time ago. At the same time, uh, Dr. David Mee Lee, uh, who I became acquainted with, uh, had proposed a similar model, um, un essentially unbundling residential treatment, the, 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 the treatment need from the housing need, uh, in, 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 which was interesting because uh, David uh, was the author of the ASAM criteria, the original placement criteria that, that now has been adopted by Connecticut and most other states. Um, in terms of that model, um, my observation, and uh, I operate the Connecticut Center for Recovery in Greenwich, um, it's a it's a very potent model, and I think it uh, probably will provide greater um, quality and outcomes than residential treatment is able to provide now in their shortened lengths of stay. And so this this model um, has has the opportunity to save. Uh, money, but also produce uh, greater outcomes. Um, it's a model that I have been working on for the last you know, 10 or so years as a consultant, uh, helping new organizations uh, come into Connecticut uh, or those that are already in Connecticut uh, that are small for-profit groups, similar to this group where it's a, a handful of folks in, in recovery who want to give back. Uh, out of gratitude um, and help others. And um, I've had the opportunity to, to set up a number of those. Um, so that, that's that's essentially the model. I also want to uh, say that, uh, that Fairfield County is my home and I am particularly interested in making sure that it has a network of quality programs. And uh, this in my personal mission, is to set up a dedicated network of these programs. Um, and one of them is in Greenwich. Uh, one was just approved for New Milford Lantana Recovery Center. And this is in Bridgeport, essentially providing a triangle of three PHPs with recovery housing. Um, and then uh, fed in part by a new application that just put into the portal yesterday that I wrote uh, for Haven Health that will um, provide a much needed uh, detox uh, program to replace the 80 beds in, in part in, in New Haven that just suddenly disappeared um, from uh, uh, New Haven. Um, and that, that program, hopefully, if it's approved, will help to feed these three programs as well as CASA in Bridgeport, which is a, a wonderful resource for Spanish speaking clients that Bridgeport is fortunate, well, the state of Connecticut is fortunate to have. And uh, so Haven's uh, proposal is to provide both English and Spanish language uh, detox services. And then this would be kind of a preferred network of these three programs uh, that will help to, uh, to feed it. Um, so that that's my uh, concept and my dream uh, for for my home county. Um, so let me talk a little bit about uh, the issues that were raised uh, and uh, where we are uh, in, in that process. Um, so uh, we uh, had one set of completeness questions um, and uh, that we responded to, and one of the Questions had to do with the percentage that we were proposing for the Medicaid uh, uh, clients. Um, originally, we proposed a, a five percent uh, guesstimate, um, and it's, it's just, just a proposal. Um, and the question back to us, I think it was question five, um, was uh, given that the poverty level in in Bridgeport was so much higher than the state, twenty two point nine percent. Why were we not um, suggesting a higher number of Medicaid. Uh, well, we're not just serving Bridgeport, we're serving the, the whole you know, service area, primary service area that has this, about the same poverty level as the state of Connecticut, roughly 10%. Um, 
Um, and so um, in looking at that and reconsidering, we said, okay, we'll, we'll raise that estimate to 10% um, to meet that. Um, we then uh, were posed with uh, this request for a hearing. Um, and again, being asked uh, to talk about the services we're providing to the Medicaid population. And so there were three questions and I'm just, I'm not gonna read my, my uh, responses that are attached to my pre-file testimony, but just kind of summarize uh, the, the way we looked at it. Um, that in terms of access from the very beginning and the applicant uh, was intended to uh, sign up for the Medicaid program, um, serve Medicaid clients. Um, and I think uh, access uh, was uh, pretty much certain the location uh, allowed for that. And the other thing that's that's very helpful in terms of accessibility to all Medicaid clients is now is uh, telemedicine. And so um, that that's going to assist um, with with access. And hopefully we'll see how it turns out with the DEA and the national policy re regarding uh, continuation of tele telehealth services uh, post COVID. Um, so then the other question was about the uh, payer mix. Uh, and again, we originally proposed 5%. Um, we upped that to 10%. And these, again, we don't know who's going to come in the door. It could be more, it could be less. We just, we really don't know until we, uh, we provide the services. But I think the, the, the sense we got was that OHS was uh, suggesting that we should uh, consider a 25%. Um, uh, there's no no any basis for that. There's there's there are no objective requirements that I'm aware of in the statutes, and this is so there's some subjectivity here in terms of interpreting and determining what's an appropriate level. So I just for the sake of argument um, took a look at what would uh, what would happen if we were to move our services from five percent to twenty five percent Medicaid, and essentially I. I, I Submitted in my testimony uh, table D, um, where it was it, you know, just strikingly clear that uh, the company would be out of business on the day that it opened up and would uh, would lose money from that and would not be a viable uh, company from service. Um, I, I think one of the things that was clearly a driver of that. Uh, was the uh, the posted rates for uh, Parkville Hospital and uh, intensive outpatient? Um, the rate for intensive outpatient was uh, one seventy five roughly, and uh, and about one seventy five, which you know would would work for some clients we would uh, you know lose money uh, at, a, at a lower rate every every uh, uh, group we ran for ILP um, because Medicaid uh, limits the participants per group to eight uh, where insurance companies do not provide that limit uh, would be a loss um, in terms of the part of the hospital let, let me explain that you know that uh, Intensive outpatient is three hours of groups per day. Um, the partial hospital is five hours of groups per day. So the, the rate for partial hospital is $11 more. So to think that $11 would cover two additional clinical hours is just, uh, it's just impossible. And it's so until, until the DSS raises those rates uh, that we couldn't possibly consider uh, providing the PHP level of care, we could consider the IOP and, and application, of course. Um, I did speak with um, uh, the uh, Assistant Director of Medicaid, uh, whether Connecticut was considering um, adjusting the rates up as they have with the residential under the 1115 waiver, um, but they indicated that, that that was not the case and the federal uh, level, it was not happening. As it turns out, I understand DSS studied its own rates and determined that they are the lowest of uh, uh, the other states in their in their group, um, and uh, they're just they're just way too low. Um, so we, we're we're kind of stuck with proposing um, a, a reasonable, I think, uh, ten percent 
um, service and, and trying to figure out how that could be affordable. Um, I, I, I then I kind of tried to understand um, why the 10% was not, or apparently not um, acceptable to, to uh, be deemed to be uh, meeting the, the, the statutory requirements for the CLN. And I was kind of surprised because uh, just two weeks earlier, I received notice of a outright CON award for another application that I submitted that uh, proposed 5%, nearly identical application. And uh, it was uh, it given an outright award uh, at, at 5%. Um, so I was caught off guard, frankly, two weeks later that there was a hearing to talk about uh, raising uh, that. Um, so I took a look at uh, the, the 13 very similar uh, uh, projects, programs that involve state treatment for SUD and co-occurring over the last 10 or so years and looked at, was it um, consistent with uh, those others? Um, what was it about this particular um, application or location, proposed location? That um, was out of line as trying to understand what the what the issues were, um, and so looking at Table C in my uh, um, response and attached to my pre-filed testimony, uh, with one exception, which was a, a, an outlier, um, there were a dozen that were approved at roughly zero to five percent Medicaid, including one two weeks prior. Um, so I had every reason to believe that we were doubling uh, what were the uh, accepted uh, uh, projects. Um, uh, so I was a little uh, confused um, and uh, couldn't, couldn't quite uh, figure that one out. I also looked at whether it was the, the idea that it was physically located in Bridgeport, which is a, a you know, clearly a high poverty rate area, but there were two others that also were in high poverty rate of, at great uh, cities that were at, uh, ex accepted at zero and five percent. So again, I wasn't really uh, clear uh, why we were not uh, deemed to be uh, meeting the uh, statutory requirements. Um, we just take a look at what else. Um, uh, so as I said, uh, you know, the 10%, I think is something that this, this is a small, uh, organization. This is a low volume, you know, low budget operation that can do its fair share and, um, to provide services, including, um, um, much lower reimbursement rates through Medicaid plus uh, some reasonable charity care um, and uh, wants to do its fair share. Um, but you know, when it starts getting beyond that, the continued uh, losses of revenue are, are you know, significantly they're below the cost of providing the care, right? simply put. Um, so uh, that's what I have to say about that question. The third, the third issue had to do with um, in-network in insurance. Um, and I think we were pretty clear from the beginning that that was something that we would be pursuing. Um, and uh, in response to that question, I gave what a, a table E, I think is a pretty detailed timeline uh, for what we think is realistic for negotiating in-network contracts um you know we don't want to uh, start that process immediately until we're up and running we've got our processes in place we have quality uh services set up and, and staffing and and joint commission accreditation i mean there are two things here that i think are important for for this uh, program to have established before it sits down at a table with an insurance company and negotiate rates and that is the fact that this is going to be duly licensed as a substance use disorder treatment facility and a psychiatric day treatment program uh, that can provide both. Um, and so it, it's uh, in, in new language, ASAM has adopted um, its fourth edition 
And so this would be considered HILT, high intensity outpatient treatment, which is a uh, new language for partial hospital and recognition that th this level of care is now being introduced by freestanding uh, programs not associated with hospitals. But it also is, uh, in, in addition to that, it's a co-occurring enhanced, meaning that it has the high capacity to fully treat mental disorders along with the SUD. And so that's an important distinction that um, uh, ought to be responded with a higher insurance rate. The other thing is that we want to get the Joint Commission accreditation and have those uh, in place before we sit down and negotiate so we're in a much better uh, position to negotiate uh, reasonable rates. Um, so um, I think that's all I have for now in this I understand there may be some questions, and uh, with, with, and you know, I mean, I certainly want to uh, you know figure out uh, how we can uh, be deemed to be uh, in compliance with the uh, CON statutes. Thank you, Mr. Rockholt. Um, I do have questions. Um, my guess is that a lot of them will be directed towards you. So I think it may make sense to to keep you in the hot seat. Okay. Um, do would you like a five minute break or? No, I'm good. Busy? I'm good. Okay. Um, so we're going to. I, I'm sorry, uh, Attorney Nolan. Did you have any additional questions or or comments for Mr. Rockholt? Okay. I I do not. I'm happy to to turn the floor over to um, OHS. Okay, and I'll give you an opportunity to sort of clarify anything that may come up uh, in the course of my questioning as well. Um, so, Mr. Rockholtz, uh, you've spoken to this uh, network that you're hoping to establish between Greenwich, New Milford, and Bridgeport. Um, do you have any continuing roles at those other locations, the one in New Milford uh, or Greenwich? In, in Greenwich, I uh, serve as the executive director, again, as a consultant at 20% effort. Uh, it's my hometown. Um, I, they don't need me for the 20% because they do such a good job. Um, but I'm available 24-7 for them. And in, in the uh, New Milford uh, program, I currently similarly serve as compliance officer. Um, I uh, help them establish a facility in Charleston, South Carolina. So they have developed an infrastructure where it's likely that my role will uh, uh, end at some point because they, they have a national compliance officer and they have a, a local executive director, but they're friends and um, will probably be working together in some way. Okay, thank you. And with respect to the application Haven uh, in New Haven, um, you spoke about filing that application yesterday. I mean, we know it's, it's a long ways from being approved. It's, it's yes. still in the analysis phase, but do you have any expectations as to what your role is going to be there? Um, so yeah, yeah. So let me be clear. I did not submit the application. I was submitted by, uh, attorney Volpe. Um, uh, I was a writer, um, I was uh, submitted in the application. Uh, my resume was submitted uh, in the role of compliance officer. Um, I am a consultant there also. Um, it's it's not certain, but it's uh, probable that I will continue in that, that or a similar role with them as a consultant um, going forward. Okay. So the, the culminating question here is, uh, do you think you'll be able to manage all of your different roles in addition to the role that you anticipate taking on for sound recovery as uh, I think you said the executive director? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm uh, also uh, involved with a couple of other organizations. Um, and so uh, with my experience, um, I uh, have no problems uh, serving in all of those roles. Okay, thank you. Um, you also mentioned in your preliminary comments that Connecticut has 
either uh, formally or informally uh, adopted the ASAM continuum of, of care model. Um, and then you made reference to a recent change to that, uh, which includes the, the high intensity outpatient treatment. Yes. Uh, do you know if Connecticut has formally adopted that as well? Um, they have not yet. Um, I know that they were very uh, strongly committed to uh, ASAM-3 um, when, when they started the process. Um, it does. Uh, it, it can be a challenge making changes uh, in in a system like that. Um, I hope they adopt it because I think it has some good changes, and it includes, among other things, recovery residences. Um, so, no, I don't know that uh, what their plans are. Okay. Um. So I'm going to turn now to um. The, the issue surrounding the, the, the anticipated Medicaid volume. Um, so you spoke a little bit to the increase from 5% to 10% earlier. Um, how does that increase in projected Medicaid volume impact Sound Recovery's projected charity care allotment, um, that scholarship fund that was referenced in the application materials? Yeah, I think that's a reasonable question. So uh, it, it remains to be seen. So essentially, by um, increasing from five to ten percent, uh, the margin is, gets tighter. And so, uh, as the margin gets tighter, the availability of uh, I think that we projected five percent of net uh, uh, revenues, um, and so that obviously would shrink. And it's a small amount, but because uh, the program is going to be essentially giving free service uh, uh, through providing the lower rate of Medicaid. Um, the um, the margins are are going to be a little bit tighter. So yeah, there'll be a slight reduction in, in that. Okay. Amount, not the not the percentage. Mm -hmm. Um. How do you anticipate sound? Can I, can I just refer to it as sound or would you prefer? Yeah, to yeah, that's yeah. Right. Uh, how will, how do you anticipate sound managing potential increases in demand for charity care above what is currently anticipated? Well, I, I, I think it remains to be seen um, what the capacity is really going to be of the facility. Um, and in terms of charity care, um, we, we would have to set up a waiting list um, for, for free care beyond what we have. Again, this is not a nonprofit. It doesn't have any endowments. It doesn't uh, receive any charitable contributions. This is uh, out of uh, the uh, owner's pockets. Um, so until it's up and running, and you know, it takes a while to get up and running. It takes it takes a while to recoup the initial investment. It takes a while to uh, start collecting uh, insurance payments. Um, so there, there's that burden that has to be overcome before we'll we'll have an idea of what the uh, the uh, revenues, the, uh, the net revenues are going to be. Okay. Um, do you have any understanding as to how the scholarship fund will be administered and what criteria will be used to determine eligibility? Will it be sort of like a first come, first serve sort of thing? I, I think uh, we submitted a charity care policy that outlines, um, I don't have it in front of me, um, you know, what the requirements are that I think it was 200% uh, of the federal poverty level. Um, and uh, it's it's approved by the executive director. Um, you know, it, I think in reality, these look, these are guys that want to help people. And uh, if there are people that are motivated and uh, start out being able to pay for some of their treatment or their insurance runs out, um, and they want to help continue them, then they will. Uh, provide some scholarship to the extent that they can. Okay, I I apologize. I must have missed it, missed that. 
Um, and I'm that? happy to, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, I'm happy to provide just a, a base site to that. So that's located at attachment eight is the charity care policy and it's Bates number 160 to 161. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, so I know you provided a revised financial worksheet uh in the pre-file i was wondering if you could speak generally to how the larger anticipated medicaid volume might impact the projected financials of sound recovery if you'll just allow us a second we're just going to put the um that revised worksheet i'm assuming you're referring to exhibit n that we submitted uh, yes Okay, group. The witness has that in front of him. Great. Thank you. Sure. And, um, give me a minute. I'll try to figure this out. It's going to be tough to answer your question here uh, without time to really study the, the uh, previous one and this one. But um, I mean, I think that we, uh, it, it looked like we uh, were doubling the uh, revenues from, from Medicaid. Um, and the Margins uh, dropped down a little bit, but there's still an, some margin, 11% first year, 15%, 15% going forward. So, you know, it's uh, it's lower than most uh, competitors um, uh, manage, um, but it, it, uh, it it's enough to cover costs and uh, start to recover some of the um, initial outlays. And so, but so it'd be viable um it would be it would be great if the uh margins were a little higher especially with a small organization like this um but it's it's sufficient to to absorb uh the 10 percent um and that and the 10 percent of course you know we um projected that as a blend of iop and op um services okay um Do you think you would be able to provide uh, projected utilization per town in the PSA? I'm trying to think, did we not already do that? Um, if, 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 well, obviously, you know, if we haven't already done that, uh, I, Yes, certainly we can, uh, you know, extrapolate by population. Okay. Um, and that's the town that's in the PSA. Right. If we, I, yeah. I don't recall seeing that in the application. It may be there. Um, so if you have provided it already, just, you know, indicate where it is in the record. And if you haven't, then... I think we would appreciate that as a late file. Sure, will do. Um, going back to the 5%, 10% uh, distinction, um, Sound said that the 5% was not intended as either a limit or a quota, but rather a likely minimum of who will actually present themselves for services. Um, yes, that's right. So would the same apply to the 10% now that you've increased it? Uh, yes, I, yeah, I think so. We, we really don't know um, who's going to come in the door. Um, I think we were you know, just indicating that we were willing to make a reasonable adjustment. And again, a projection um, that, you know, well, it was... Uh, to considerably higher than uh, similar projects, and I understand we can't. We're not supposed to compare. Uh, you know, one one application is not the same as another. But um, there were twelve of them, and I wrote ten of them, so I know that they're they're pretty much the same uh, uh, applications. Um, but you know, y yes, it's. Uh, it, uh, open to, I mean, we may, we may uh, take more in, but uh, I wouldn't, 
you know, want to commit to uh, a minimum of uh, much higher than that. You know, I don't, uh, I don't know that uh, we're in a position to, anybody is in a position to commit to uh, a minimum percentage, but um, if we were able to serve more, I, we would serve them. Um, so similar to the question that I asked earlier about um, the charity care policy, what, would there come a time or would there come a point where if you had too many Medicaid patients seeking your services, you would have to place them on some sort of wait list or, or redirect them elsewhere? Well, yeah, I mean, there are, there are certainly other services there, but there are not nonprofits in Bridgeport uh, that uh, receive public funding and are set up. I think obviously we would, uh, in fact, you know, it, um, I've gotten some feedback from some other providers who are, uh, you know, concerned that we're going to be taking their Medicaid clients away from them. You know, so um, we don't want to do that. We don't want to put any nonprofits uh, in, in, in jeopardy. Um, but, you know, that would be the first thing that we want to do is make sure people get the care. You need to uh, respond when they're ready. And uh, there, there are a number of providers in, in Bridgeport for certain that uh, uh, can take them. So that would be the first choice. I, waiting lists, uh, I don't like waiting lists. People don't do well on waiting lists. Okay. Um, does Sound have any sort of plans for achieving the projected Medicaid numbers? Or is it just, as you said, whoever comes through the door comes through the door and they will be served? Well, uh, in my experience, what happens when a new organization opens up and the word is gets out that this new place accepts Husky, Medicaid, all of the other providers steer everybody towards them. Okay. <laughs> That's just how it works. But you don't have any doubts that, that that number will be achievable? I do not have any doubts. Okay. Um, will payer source be a factor in determining access to either the PHP, IOP, or OP components of sound? Yeah, so certainly with the PHP, that's uh, that's a little trickier. Um, depending on the plans, some plans will not cover it. Um, and so um, it, it's going to be a little tricky, even with those who have commercial insurance, um, or they may have used up their uh, benefits um, and uh, need to pay out of pocket. So I think in that sense, yeah, PHP can be a little tricky. IOP, uh, you know, I think uh, the benefits are a little easier to um, collect. Um, so I, I mean, we certainly aren't uh, going to be saying, well, we can't take this uh, person because uh, um, we, we have too many IOPs or, um, you know, they, they have any uh, uh, limits and you know, we're not going to reject people because uh, um, we have uh, some people that are paying lower rates or whatever. But, okay. Yeah. So you, you don't anticipate that like the 10% Medicaid that you're projecting will be all PHP or all IOP or all? Oh, it, it's, um, it would be IOP and OP for the Medicaid. Okay. I mean, yeah, clearly, yeah, the PHP rate for uh, in Medicaid is just completely untenable. Okay. Um, and frankly, you know, in, in terms of the model I described, um, you know, the availability of, um, you know, supportive sober housing for um, folks on Medicaid is, is extremely limited. So they would they wouldn't they wouldn't have that as a as a resource not a requirement but preferable but uh, the the rate is absolutely uh, unrealistic. So you mentioned a few minutes ago that that PHP is often not covered by insurance. It, it, it's not always covered by insurance. Um, 
and by, by, by all policies uh, and often is lumped in with residential treatment so that if somebody comes through detox and residential, they, they may have burned through that um, pocket of money in their benefits. Um, it, 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 in some policies, it's a different um, pool than IOP and OP. Okay. And all right, we, we might we might come back to that. I, I think I have some additional questions. I just haven't sort of yeah. formulated them yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I I guess I I do have one question. It so PHP won't be offered to Medicaid, just to, to clarify. Uh, unless and until DSS uh, is able to post a rate that comes anywhere near the cost of providing that care, it's it, it's going to put us out of business. Okay. We, we tested that, and uh, that, that was the case. It just... So when you say you tested that, you mean you, you did some some yeah that, that was the, that, that was the table that I referred to uh, table D okay. um, yeah all right um so on pages. 38 and 39 of exhibit A, that's the application. Uh, just let me know when you, you have that pulled up. We have that in front of the witness. Okay. Um, so you list 15 other provider locations in the PSA that offer one or more of PHP, IOP, or OP services. Um, you do not provide any information with respect to their utilization, though. I assume that's because you have no involvement in their in their operations, so you you wouldn't have that information. Well, um, and yeah, you, know, you uh, utilization in outpatient is really kind of uh, a non uh, uh, figure. There are no capacities in outpatient. There are in residential. So for a place to say, well, we're 80% uh, utilization of, of what, you know? Um, so speaking more generally though, do, do you know whether they, those other facilities are at their max? I mean, I, I understand the capacity is, is probably not the best word, but are they maxed out in terms of the services that they're able to provide to the, the patient population? Uh, I, I don't know that there's any way to, you know, you know, if you call them, they'll, they'll give you an answer, but it won't, be, won't necessarily be accurate. Um, these are all, these are all competitors that are in business buying for clients and buying to make money, uh, for the most part, except for the nonprofits. But, um, again, there are no, uh, stated capacities if they, um, if they have more uh, clients, like in periods of time such as now, when people are looking for treatment, um, if they have um, higher numbers of applicants, they'll open up another group. Okay. Um, so looking at that town, there are uh, a number, there, there are 10 towns listed. Um, that don't have any of the proposed services, those being Ansonia, Easton, Fairfield, Milford, Monroe, Orange, Reading, Stratford, Trumbull, and Woodbridge. Uh, so why was Bridgeport selected over those locations? Uh, Bridgeport was uh, selected because of mostly the availability of uh, reasonably cost uh, office space. And uh, the owner, uh, the managing member, Phil DeGenero, is a real estate um, person, and he knows a lot of people and was able to find a suitable location that was uh, accessible. Um, and uh, so that was the reason for that selection. Okay. 
uh, right on the you know on the bus line and uh, accessible. Um, did Sound conduct any sort of formal needs assessment to determine whether there is sufficient unmet demand for the proposed services in that area? Um, not a formal uh, business assessment. I think um, this is uh, th this model, this PHP model, um, is only offered by a few providers. Um, most of these providers you'll see are um, IOP. The only one that's listed here that has PHP is CASA, which is a Spanish-speaking uh, service. And so the, the door is basically wide open. Um, this, as I said, this is a kind of a new model that's being brought to Connecticut. And uh, so um, it, it's, a, it, it, it's I even, I think I even put it in the application. It's a, it's a situation of if you build it, they will come. And uh, the other providers, that's exactly what they experienced. Okay. It's, 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 a, it's a level of care that really was historically really was not provided in Connecticut because so I said, 85% of the services in Connecticut were in the nonprofit sector, and they're they're primarily long-term residential treatment and methadone programs. And there were no uh, day treatment programs per se. Um, it's it's a new uh, it's a new thing, and uh, it's, so it's an it's an emerging model, and it's starting to gain popularity, and the outcomes are good. So there are only a few in Connecticut. Um. Are you familiar with the LifeBridge organization in the Fairfield Bridgeport area? Sounds familiar. Um, if you could give me a little bit of information about them, they might, they probably know them, but. Uh... Um, let's come back to that, I think in a few minutes. Um, I'll be able to to pull up their their information on e license and and get you their like what actual services they're currently providing. Um, so I, I am going to want to talk about them briefly in a few minutes, but um, so on. Sticking with page 16, I'm sorry, we were talking about pages 38 and 39. Uh, going back to page 16 of the application, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so sound performed an analysis of how the target patient population is currently being served utilizing SAMHSA data. Um, it relies on old data from 2015 and 2016, um, at least based on the, the link that was provided. Um, SAMHSA obviously has more updated information than that. Um, would you be willing to update that analysis using more recent information? Yes. Um, so we would want that as a late file, okay. um, just so that we make sure we have the most current information available. So that's 8B, I think it is, right? Okay. Um, and it's also written in a, in a pretty broad sense um with respect to like the state of Connecticut as a whole um is it possible for you to tailor that analysis a little more towards the greater Bridgeport planning region or Demis region one so this is in terms of the uh projected need or what what specifically are you looking for yeah projected need Okay. Um, I'm... And the, the reason why I'm asking this is like the, the data sort of looks at the state's need for PHP services as a, as a whole and then assumes that based on this, 
And, and since there's no PHP provided in Bridgeport, that there is automatically a need there. Um, so I'm just trying to sort of close that gap a little bit. Um, so it's, this is a real challenge. So, uh, you know, it's asked a number of ways, you know, uh, how many people need PHP versus ILP? There, there's, there's no available data nationally or in the state or locally to, to provide that information. In the response on page uh, 17, you see that in terms of determining need, we relied on the DEMIS-funded Regional Behavioral Health Action Organization uh, did their, their needs assessment of that of the area for Southwestern Connecticut, and uh, they specifically identified as their top priority outpatient services, including partial hospitalization. So um, I think we relied on the state's funded uh, planning uh, organization to, to uh, provide evidence of the need. Okay. And when was that published? I, I seem to recall that being an, an old publication, like 2010 or something. Yeah, that was the last time that they did actual needs assessments. Since that time, they, uh, they, they've, they're they providing more epidemiological data and uh, uh, reporting on uh, their more current activities. They haven't, they, they stopped doing treatment needs assessments around that time. Well, all of them did. Okay. So to your to your knowledge, there's no real, there's no better way to isolate Bridgeport and, and the PSA for no, that, that, no, that, that's that's it. Okay. Um. On page forty of Exhibit A. Actually, before we move on, so going back to, to LifeBridge, um, so they offer, their, their license has both POCA and substance abuse in the Bridgeport Fairfield area. They have a couple of facilities there. Um, the reason I bring them up um, is they had a day program in Bridgeport from April 2009 to March 2021, uh, which was only a two mile or eight minute drive from your proposed location. Um, our understanding in speaking with DPH is that they voluntarily uh, uh, gave up their license in March of 2021. And I was just wondering if you had any understanding as to why they may have closed uh, at that point. Um, so they're a nonprofit, is that right? I believe so, yes. Yeah, yeah. so um, I'm surprised that there were any uh, nonprofits that were able to sustain a day treatment program. Uh, but uh, sounds like post COVID, uh, uh, they may have had some financial challenges. I, I, uh, I can certainly um, take a closer look. As, um, I don't know the organization, although I probably know who runs it and just don't, don't recall. Um, um, but again, you know, I don't know what funding they were receiving as a nonprofit for day treatment. Um, and, and, you know, there are, there are, um, if they didn't have the MHDT license, uh, then they you know, may not have had a true full part of the hospital program. There are the SUD license allows uh, for checking the boxes of day and evening programs. And those are uh, maybe not as intensive as the PHP programs are. I'm just surmising. I, I don't know. They didn't pop up uh, on my search for mental health day treatment license. Um, they were licensed as mental health day treatment. Oh, they were? Okay. MHDT. Uh, well, I could uh, certainly do a little bit of research and uh, provide you with an opinion on that. Um, so our concern, of course, is that since this one was open for a number of years and then suddenly shut its doors, but maintained its other facilities. 
whether that's an indication that it's not a, vi a financially viable uh, project for that specific area. Well, um, it may be the uh, the organization and not the area. That's that's very true. Um, so I'm going to think about how we want to address that. I, I may ask for some sort of late file, um, but we'll take a break, not right now, but we, we will take a break and I'll think about that and, and sort of mull it over with the analysts and then we'll, we'll come back to you about that. Um, so turning again to page 40 of exhibit A, the application. Um, so too, can I just for, uh, as I think about your comment, just step back a bit. Um, um, so again, you know, we're, we're talking about, uh, the, uh, 12 to 13 town region, not just Bridgeport. Uh, so the, the volume, you know, becoming from, you know, Fairfield County, not just Bridgeport. I understand that. Um, my expectation, I, I don't know this for sure, but my understanding is that, um, well, not my understanding. My my guess or assumption is that their their client base was also not just coming from Bridgeport, but was coming from you know a greater PSA. Um, on page forty of the application, sound stated that there is a denial of need and stigma among this population. Um. How does sound recovery anticipate addressing these issues to ensure that it meets its volume projections? The, the, the stigma is a is a broad general cultural issue that we're we're facing. Um, denial is part of the uh, disease of addiction. Um, I think what we intend to do is we, we will be deploying individuals out into the communities um, to provide education and information about our services. We'll have a website that will provide information. Um, but much of this is uh, developing relationships with referents who uh, see people who need these levels of care. That's primarily clinicians, individual clinicians. Um, and this also will be fed by step downs from detox and residential programs. I think particularly when you're talking about partial hospital, it tends to be more fed by detox programs and residentials. A lot of people in Connecticut go out of state to, to receive those services. Witness James's experience at a number of treatment facilities outside of the state of Connecticut, and they come back to Fairfield County or the, the general area. So um, we anticipate that that's gonna be a significant volume. Now, when I talk about the, the we refer to the stigma and denial, um, trying to get outreach into the communities to encourage people to seek treatment who are not currently seeking treatment. That's the most effective uh, tool we would have. We can't change the society culture. It, it's working very hard to do it itself. There's been a great deal of progress in, in reducing stigma. There are efforts on a national level um, and there are this federal funding coming into the state of Connecticut to help with that. Um, but we, we can't change the culture. We can uh, one by one uh, reach out to, to people and, and encourage them to come into treatment. Okay. Thank you. Um, so statements throughout sound recoveries filings seem to indicate that PHP services are the most needed within this PSA. Would you agree with that? Um, I don't recall saying it was the most needed within. I think there, every level of care is needed in the PSA. I think it's one that's um, that hasn't been in really available. 
Um, so it's, it's, I think that, that's more the issue of availability. There are only a few programs in the state of Connecticut that offer that level of care. Those that have, uh, have opened the door to that level of care um, are, uh, are full. I mean, Turnbridge was the first one in, in New Haven, and they've been busting at the seams. Uh, Greenwich Recovery Center opened up the PHP and was was full within a short period of time. Lantana anticipates the same thing. They when they did this in South Carolina, there were no PHP programs. Uh, well, there were thirty five um, clients served in the whole state of South Carolina. They opened up and they quickly added fifty because they opened up and made it available. So there are only a handful of such programs in Connecticut. It's, as I said, it's very desirable level of care and it's a, it's a, a very cost effective and clinically effective alternative to residential treatment. Um, so we expect that it's gonna be uh, well received. Um, well, why do you think there isn't currently a facility in Bridgeport offering PHP? I couldn't tell you. Um, there, there may be applicants, that we, there are new applicants coming in uh, uh, as we speak, looking to open up PHP in Fairfield County, whether specifically in Bridgeport, I couldn't tell you um, why nobody has opened up there. Um, I think, in, in some ways, uh, they look for more rural types of settings, um, suburban types of settings. Um, but I, I can't speak to why Bridgeport would not have one. Okay. Um, so I'm, go I'm going to make an assertion, and I would just sort of like you to react to it when, I, when I'm done. Um, and my assertion is this, just because there are no PHP programs in Bridgeport doesn't necessarily mean that there is a need for them. It could simply be that the services needed are everything but PHP. So what would your response to that be? Um, well, I, I don't know what that's based on, and I haven't seen any studies to talk to that. What I can say again is that the Regional Behavioral Action uh, Organization specifically mentioned it as, as a needed service, along with uh, the other outpatient levels of care. Um, again, there are, there's no data available to distinguish between the needs for any of those different levels of outpatient services. Um, but I, I, uh, I would assert that um, there, there is uh, certainly the need. Um, there's a lack of this service in the area. Um, and it uh, has proven itself to be a desirable level of care that people are attending in, in most states at this point. Um, so we've received some commentary from Demas in the, recently that there are some facilities that are getting licensed for IOP and OP services and then simply aren't providing those services, they're providing other services. Um, so are you willing to commit to actually providing those or are you just seeking to get licensed for those? Are you, you talking about for PHP? That we would get a license for PHP and not provide it? IOP and OP, not PHP. Uh, no, I think uh, IOP is certainly a, probably going to have a higher volume in this facility than, than Parkville Hospital will. Okay. Um, and yes, absolutely uh, outpatient. I don't know why we wouldn't do that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I only have a couple more questions and then we'll, we'll take a break. Um, 
sound recovery talks about forming collaborative agreements with sober homes in the area. Uh, can you comment on what sorts of services these sober homes currently offer? So uh, there are a number of sober homes that are in the general area, um, but sound recovery because it believes so strongly in in the model of having a uh, closely affiliated um, sober living environment or environments is in the process of um, leasing leasing a former sober home in Bridgeport right now, uh, and. That is that had operated for several years and, and uh, stopped serving, um, and so we will be ensuring that we have that close connection. Um, we haven't reached out yet to form any kind of formal agreements with the sober living uh, environments, but uh, I'm very aware of. Uh, Connecticut Association of Recovery Residences, um, and uh, I know most of the owners, um, and will um, look to develop those uh, referral networks. We, you know, we have to be sure we're going to be able to be opening up first. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want you to commit to anything, but do you? have any understanding as to where geographically this the sound recoveries sober home would be in relation to this proposed facility it's on brooklawn avenue in bridgeport okay it, it would not be owned by so sound recovery it would be owned by another uh company okay um and the, the sober homes in the area, do you happen to know if any of them offer PHP, IOP, or OP services? I, not PHP, obviously, but IOP or OP? I, I'm not aware of any in the immediate area that uh, offer them. Well, I mean, they can't offer it as part of their um, recovery residence. They would have to have a separate you know, facility. I'm not the only one I'm aware of. The nearest one I'm aware of is Turnbridge in New Haven that also has a treatment facility uh, affiliated with it. Um, and then outside of uh, a place in Greenwich, um, I mean, I could uh, look around and ask around, but I'm not aware of any offhand. Okay. Thank Maybe you. Not. Yeah. Um, so at this point, I think it makes sense to take, let's say a 10 minute break. So we'll come back around, let's say 1050. Right. Um, yes. and again, a reminder to everybody who's here that we will stop the recording, but the audio and the visual may still be visible or heard. So please turn your audio and visual off. Um, and we will come back at 1050. Thank you. And it looks like it is. Okay. Uh, welcome back. For those just joining us, this is uh, the Hearing and Sound Recovery Services LLC, docket number 24-32702-CON. Uh, we had most of the technical portion up until now. I do have some additional questions for uh, the applicant's witnesses, but before I get into that, Attorney Nolan wanted to make some remarks uh, about one of the late files, so I'm going to turn it over to her at this time. Sure, and I'm not even positive that we had agreed that this was going to be a late file, but I wanted to state our position on the record. Um, with regard to the LifeBridge organization that was previously operating in the proposed service area, um, I would object to any sort of late file that's asking the applicant to state a position as to why that organization, which is not at all affiliated with sound recovery, close its doors. We have no personal knowledge of that. And any sort of statement we would we were to put on the record would be purely speculation. And I don't think it's appropriate um, for us to be speculating on why that organization that we are not at all affiliated with closed. Um, and so I would object to us 
um, to an order that directs us to late file something about, you know, essentially we have no knowledge of. I, I will sustain the objection. Um, I, I wasn't planning to make a, a late file in that regard. So, I, but I do appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so I will ask a couple more questions and then I will turn it back over to you, Attorney Nolan. Um, so exhibit P, that's that spreadsheet that we uploaded um, a couple days ago that had Durham when it wasn't supposed to include Durham. Uh, we have corrected that and rerun the numbers. Um, the total Medicaid count percentage for the PSA uh, is 35%. And the 24% which is the, the adult Medicaid count percentage, 18 plus, uh, would jump up a little bit as well. Um, so I know that we're going to file a corrected version of this, but given you know th those sort of uh, rounded numbers, uh, do you have any response to that exhibit P? Uh, that you would like to make at this time, or would you prefer to reserve until uh, after the hearing? Uh, I I think you know we can speak generally as to Exhibit P as it is currently filed, but we'd like the opportunity to review the revised numbers as corrected um, prior to you know uh, uh, we have to see it first. Okay. Uh, <laughs> But I'm, I'm happy to let Mr. Rockholtz uh, comment on Exhibit P as we have it on a general matter with the understanding that we'll be able to supplement those comments uh, when we receive the revised version. Understood. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's useful information. So I think, you know, originally we responded to the challenge that there was a uh, um, higher uh, poverty rate and that we responded that the poverty rate in the PSA was about 10%, which is the same as the state. And we're, we're viewing this as a, um, a regional and not just a Bridgeport um, uh, project. And so I thought we responded to that fairly. And I think that, you know, particularly in light of the other dozen uh, nearly identical applications that uh, responded uh, similarly or not quite as uh, uh, as uh, strongly as we did, um, this is an introduction of another way of viewing uh, the PSA and who's in the PSA. I'm not I'm not aware of any uh, specific statute that talks about the requirement that we um, meet um, the, the uh, volume of Medicaid uh, clients in the population, and it hasn't certainly been applied to any of the pre other previous uh, applicants. So. I don't know really how to respond to that. We uh, we did our uh, estimate of the impact if we were to provide our services to 25% Medicaid and we would not be able to do business. Okay, thank you. And the last question I have is uh, in the, on page 12 of the application, uh, sound recovery indicates that it's in the process of developing a referral agreement with Bridgeport Hospital. Um, I was just wondering if you were able to provide an update on that. Well, we, we have not yet uh, gotten uh, secured a written agreement, but we intend to. Okay. Uh, we, we, I, know, I know that's something that we uh, need to have for licensure, and so we will have it certainly by then. Okay. Thank you. Um, Attorney Nolan, did you have any questions that you would want to pose to either Mr. Rockholtz or uh, either of the De Janeiro's? I do not. I, I will save my comments um, for the end and um, I'm, I'm happy to um, turn, it, turn it back over to, to OHS. Okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I do need like a few minutes just to talk through late files with um, 
the analysts because I haven't been tracking those. Um, so let's come back at 11.10. Um, so far, we don't have anyone signed up to make public comment. If anyone is listening who would like to make public comment, um, please sign up in the chat. And we will take you uh, when we come back. Um, you're also free to submit written public comment to concomment at ct.gov. Um, so I will see everyone back, let's say 1110, and we will wrap things up. Great. Uh, welcome back. This is uh, a hearing concerning the CON application filed by Sound Recovery Services, LLC, docket number 24-24. 32702-COM. Sign up for public comment has been from 9 a.m. until now in the Zoom comments section. Uh, right now, there are no public co comment signups. So uh, anyone who would wish to submit public comment is still free to do so uh, within the next seven, seven days, seven calendar days. Uh, it can submit those in writing to concomment at ct.gov, but we are going to move past the public portion uh, of today's hearing, and we are going to return back to uh, the applicants themselves, or the applicant itself. Um, so I wanted to discuss the late files at this time. Um, the first one that I have, and uh, I invite discussion on this uh, if necessary. The first one I have is to provide projected utilization per town in the PSA. Yes, um, we are happy. We we can agree to wait file that. That's no problem. Okay. Uh, number two, I have uh, updated SAMHSA data for those pages in the application that I referenced. I believe it was pages 15 and 16 and, and the analysis that was conducted on use, utilizing that SAMHSA data. Um, I will just caveat to the extent that updated data is available. We can agree to provide that and, and update the analysis. Okay. Um, Related to that, if there are any other, this this will be number three, and this is one that we didn't specifically discuss earlier, but I think it's important. Um, so if necessary, we can have a discussion now. Um, any other data that you think separately demonstrates the need for each of the proposed services, those being PHP, IOP, and OP? Uh, given the need, given the existence of the other providers in the PSA. Um, so that could be any data that, any data sources that, that you think might be relevant. Um, and we are specifically interested in that, uh, given the reliance on IOP and OP um, for this application. You right. Can you can you clarify what you mean not, uh, in terms of reliance? Um, we so we went into this hearing today with the understanding that recovery or sound recovery was focusing its efforts on PHP. That that goes back to one of my earlier questions. Um, now it appears that. PHP, IOP, and OP are going to be sort of looked at uh, in a more holistic fashion. Like they're, they're, it's those are going to be focused on as well. It's not just going to be PHP. Uh, so our goal is to ensure that um, to the greatest extent possible, there is a need for IOP and OP services in the area. Uh, given Mr. Rockholtz's comment earlier that you know, the existing providers in the area could just add another group if necessary. Um, so, you know, that's that's a concern that we have. Like, do we actually need this additional facility 
for IOP and OP if these other facilities can just add another group. Can I just confer with Mr. Rockholtz briefly before I state my position? Sure. That's fine. Thank you. Um, if you'd like to go off record, that's fine as well. Um, if you want a few minutes to discuss. Well, um, just before I do that, are are those the three late files? Because um, if there are any others, then I'm happy to, you know, we can address them all at once. There was one more. It was, okay. uh, if you think it's appropriate or if you would like a response to corrected Medicaid table exhibit S that we will be filing after the hearing. Okay, if we could just take two minutes um, so I can discuss with Mr. Rockholds um, the late files and then um, we can come back on. I just want to confer with him for just a moment. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. So we can stop the recording. Welcome back again. Uh, this is a hearing regarding sound recovery services uh, application for a new uh, behavioral health facility in the Bridgeport area. It's docket number 24-32702-COM. Um, we just took a few minute breaks for uh, a few minute break for the applicant to discuss with uh, her counsel, his counsel. I am really bumbling my words. I apologize. <laughs> um the uh the late files so now we are back on record and um attorney nolan i will turn it over to you at this point sure so um we were discussing uh late file number three in which the office has asked for any other data we feel separately demonstrates a need in the P psa specifically in reference to iop and op services um we can agree to um reduce or you know to produce a late file to the extent that data is available um, as to those specific um, services. We do not feel particularly confident that such data does exist, um, but we will endeavor to look and we will provide it if, if there is available and relevant data to provide. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, did you have any comments on the rest of the uh, late files? Uh, no, I, I think I made my comment as to number two, which is similarly to the extent that updated SAMHSA data exists, we, we will provide it. Okay, perfect. Um, so I think we're all set with the late files then. Uh, Attorney Nolan, uh, did you have any additional questions that you wanted to ask of your witnesses before you gave uh, closing remarks? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. So, uh, oh, the late files. How long do you expect oh. uh, you will need in order to get those back to us? Um, can we say 10 days? Sure. Great. And... I always say if you need additional time, that's fine as well, but most applicants are eager to move the process along. So uh, 10 days is fine, but if you do need more time, just let us know. That's it, that's all right. There goes the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can make your closing remarks now, whenever you're ready. Sure, um, and, and I will be brief because um, I think we've discussed many of these issues throughout. Um, sound recovery has proposed this PHP IOP OP facility to serve not just the Bridgeport area, but the 15 or so towns in the proposed service area. Um, this is a for-profit organization. They're seeking to invest their own money. They're not asking for any state assistance. Um, they have seen in their own personal experiences and through the data provided that there is a need for these services in the area um, and would like to invest their own money in order to meet that need. Um, we believe that we have demonstrated that need sufficiently under the statutes. 
Um, and the DEMAS funded RBHAO study, which is attached at attachment four and Bates number beginning at 096, identifies under priority number one as PHP and IOP uh, facilities in the region. Uh, we would also uh, state that we are committed to providing IOP and OP. Um, we do not intend to be a facility that would be licensed for them and then not provide them. And in fact, that is where we anticipate the Medicaid volume would come from um, because we don't propose to provide uh, the PHP service to Medicaid individuals. Um, the statute focuses more on duplication of services rather than a, a lack of services in the area. Um, and at the end of the day, OHS should want to license financially viable facilities. Um, as we've demonstrated, we are committed to doing our fair share to serve the Medicaid population in a financially viable way. Um, and in fact, General Statute 19A-6 39 sub A sub 4 requires the applicant to demonstrate financial feasibility and to do so um, to increase the Medicaid volume any higher to match the proposed or the, the Medicaid population in the proposed service area would simply make the business not financially viable and in turn would result in there being no services provided. Um, so if the option is some services or no services, we obviously think that we would much rather provide the services and we very much want to provide the services in this area and through this uh, facility. Um, we, would, as I said, we are very committed to this mission. This is a personal mission for the owners. We have signed on one of the best experts in the, I'll say, country. Um, in order to assist them in doing so. And we would ask the office to approve the application pursuant to um, General Statute 19A-639. And we would be happy to answer any other questions that the office has. Thank you. Um, thank you all for attending today. Um, thank you, especially to Mr. Rockholtz and Mr. DeGenero and Mr. DeGenero and you as well, uh, Attorney Nolan. Um, a reminder again that written public comment can be submitted up to seven days from now at concomment at ct.gov. Um, I am going to be adjourning this hearing, but the record will remain open until closed by OHS after receipt and review of the late files. Uh, so. Thank you again to everyone, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all again in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Hearing Officer.